welcome to Earth Village. I'm here today with Brian Lacey, a local beekeeper. Is that how you would describe your profession? Or a bee guardian. A bee guardian. Yes. Okay. A, a new a new term for an ancient craft. That that sounds about right. I've seen some of the bee garden guardians come in and rescue some of our bee swarms that we get in the garden here. Good. Good. So I would call him a guardian. I do too. So, um, why do we need bees? Well, bees for uh, hundreds of millions of years have been the creature, the animal that makes the plant world happy, therefore making the animal world happy. So we have a plant kingdom and an animal kingdom, and there's lots of different kinds of pollinators, and a lot, most of them are insects. Um, and the generic term would be bees, but you know, more broadly, be butterflies and moths as well. But bees really do the lion's share of um, of uh, making the blossom pollinated, so that it gives fruit uh, and produces healthy offspring in the plant world. And all of animals, you know, d need that kind of relationship between the plant and the animal kingdom for the cycle of life to continue. I see. Are hummingbirds also a pollinator? They sure are. They are? Yep. Okay. All right. That's good to know. Um, as are bats. You know, there's many bats that pollinate as well. Bats. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know because we have honeybees here, but we also have mason bees mm -hmm. that we have, um, like, homes for. But right. then we also have uh, bumblebees, mm -hmm. uh, like tons of bumblebees sure. out in the garden. So yeah. those are all pollinators? They sure are. Uh, what about wasps? Some wasps will pollinate. Most of them will. Mm -hmm. uh, as well as catch uh, mosquitoes and eat dead carrion. So they're omnivores like we are. Uh-huh, so wasps will catch mosquitoes. They sure can. Did not know that. Yes. All right. Um, so you can see we have different types of <clears throat> hives here. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not really sure how, is it a war hive? Waré. Waré, mm -hmm. and then the Langstroth. Mm-hmm. Okay, and the, the top bar. Mm -hmm. So what are the differences between those? Well, uh, a Langstroth has a rectangle design in it hung on either end. So it's sort of the, like a coat hanger hangs from the middle, but a Langstroth frame has tabs so that the frame itself rests on either end, and the bees make their comb in the middle. Here's one that has been filled out. So this is what the bees will do with it. They will fill it out mm -hmm. like so. So oh the, this is this is considered to be a Langstroth frame, yeah, a deep one. They come in different heights. Now, and this one has juicy with honey too. Um, the uh, top bar hive uh, has only a top bar, and uh, the bees are intended to be guided underneath each one of these bars, and it and they make their hive lengthwise. So it's a trapezoid. If you look at the end of it, it's about 17 inches long on the top. Then it telescopes down to about 10 or 12 inches on the bottom, and they're usually about oh, 12 inches tall. But they can be this wide or wider. So that's a top bar hive, and then the waray hive is roughly 14 by 14 by 14 in a cube, and it also only has a top bar, it does not have end bars or a bottom bar. So the bees are guided to build their comb down each one of those little frames. There's also such a thing as called a long box which is a Langstroth frame, Langstroth hive, but it's all built on its side. So it's like a uh, top bar hive, except that instead of having sloping sides, it's got square sides. And it's just, a, it's just a Langstroth hive on its side. It's like a big, long coffin full of Langstroth frames. Mm -hmm. So those are, those, that encompasses almost all of your hive design types. And it, I mean, is there one that you would recommend over another type? I think Langstroth's uh, far and away are the easiest to work with. Uh, one of the things that can happen with uh, with uh, Waré and with uh, Top Bar, because they only offer the top bar, not the end, not the end or the bottom bars, is that oftentimes the bees will knit comb against the side of the box, 
which if you wanted to manage the hive at all, and some people don't want to, some people just want to let the hive be like a wild hive and not go in and do anything with it, which is okay for many. Uh, in an urban setting especially, um, being able to check your hive and be able to split it up in the spring so that it doesn't swarm, or you, rather you can control the swarm, rather than let the, uh, the swarm uh, fly out and maybe go into an uninsulated part of a house. Because I'm called upon all the time to cut into structures to remove bees that have moved into a structure. Because that's what they'll do when they swarm. With the lack of big trees with cavities, which is an increasing problem in urban areas, uh, the bees don't have their natural home, which is a big tree cavity. Uh, instead, they're going to find a cavity in a structure. So being able to manage a swarm so that your bees do not fly into a structure is better for everybody, including the, um, the, uh, the rapport, the, uh, the perception that people in urban areas have about bees. Mm -hmm. so, so I like Langstraw frames for that reason. Mm -hmm. And I recommend them to my students. Yeah, um, now the, our bee team was out cleaning one of the hives mm -hmm. and it was one of these type of hives. Mm -hmm. They were pulling those frames out and then I think scraping like last year's honeycomb off okay. them and then they had some wires holding, mm -hmm. holding in, like holding the frames together. Mm -hmm. um, so is that something, is there a lot of maintenance with beehives? There are, uh, as I'm an, I've been a beekeeper, I'm 61 now, I started beekeeping at age 13. Uh, at this point in my career, I offer bees just an empty frame with a little guiding uh, uh, center point for the bees to grow their comb on. And the reason I do that, uh, especially in the brood area, the area where the baby bees are being born, is that it's much easier when the comb gets old and dark, which is what happens after many, many layings of the egg in, in, this, in this warmest part of the hive, the comb will get dark and the, you won't see the clear hexagons. They'll get small and dark and round and the wax picks up more uh, viruses in it and toxins, just like fat in animals. Uh, wax is where you will have a congregation of toxins. So I will, uh, I will migrate a frame like that out of the brood chamber so that I can harvest it out and reopen it so that bees can grow fresh comb in there and resume a healthy brood chamber. In the honey area, which is usually above uh, where the baby bees are, then um, it's okay to put in wires, this sort of thing, something that is going to give the comb more structure so that when you put it in a giant salad spinner to centrifuge out the honey for a harvest, you won't have blowout of the comb because the comb can be rather soft um, when it's in a, the honey room when you're doing the, doing the extraction. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of die off of, of the bees. There has. Is that because of the virus or the fungus? Well, die off has to do with background toxins, a decline in uh, forage, good forage, uh, which is, has to do with monocropping and genetically modified organisms and the like. Uh, and urbanization. Uh, there's also, uh, part of the problem is within the commercial beekeeping world itself, where you've got uh, the vast majority, like 95% of the bees in uh, the United States, for example, are commercial. So uh, around January all the way through uh, Valentine's Day, uh, a huge fraction of the commercial bees migrate from wherever they are, whether it's Vermont or New York or Washington, Montana, and they all congregate on flatbed trucks down to the San Joaquin Valley in Southern California to pollinate the almond harvest. So, uh, and there are a number of really, I think, uh, unfortunate uh, uh, systemic uh, habits that commercial beekeepers have gotten into, including feeding their bees uh, corn syrup, and soybean powder as a protein to wake them up and boost them to get the populations up so that when they are placed in a almond uh, orchard uh, the, they can get the big dollars per hive for the pollination of the almond. And there's a lot of sharing of viruses and, and on many occasions there may be an inappropriate application of miticides uh, and there's a sharing of viruses between these bees that come from different parts of the United States. So it's a bit of a SHIT storm for uh, the health of bees. 
which contributes to some of these uh, declines. Mm -hmm. Luckily, uh, beekeepers that keep their bees in one place are breeding for the strongest genetics. Um, that is, I think, the best direction to go within the world of honeybees, which is just one kind of bee. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the one that we've come to depend on a lot, but there are hundreds of different uh, native bees that are important pollinators as well. What are, what are the native, are mason bees native bees? Native bees, yeah. Anything okay. but a honeybee is going to be a native bee. Bumblebees, mason bees, leaf cutter bees, resin bees, sweat bees, all of these are native solitary bees. Are there any benefits to um, kind of making homes and places for native bees rather than keeping honeybees? Absolutely. My, my attitude is if you don't want to harvest propolis, which is tree resin that honeybees collect mm -hmm. and put all over their hive and is all over these frames. Like this is propolis right here. I'll harvest some right now. I'm gonna put it on the table and this looks like a good one. And I'm just gonna slowly push it off like so. This chunk right here is tree resin that the bees have collected and it's called propolis. Mm -hmm. And their bodies are always rubbing up against it. The more I warm it between my fingers, the softer it gets because mm -hmm. it is, it's very much like, you know, it, it's a resin. So as it gets warmer, it will uh, soften up. But uh, this, the propolis is a Greek word meaning the gate before the city, meaning yes to beneficial trade, no to attack. <laughs> so it allows beneficial microbes, whether it's uh -huh. yeast or bacteria or fungi, viruses, uh, but it, it allows beneficial but blocks malicious. Mm -hmm. And human beings, have been eating it for thousands of years. If you had a serious infection, oral or blood disease or something like that, if you were to eat uh, you know, some of this every day, it would cleanse your whole body of that problem and save your life. I'll eat so, some right now. Oh yay. Um, Delicious. So why, why do the bees swarm? Bees swarm is, that's their version of giving birth. So uh, mammals uh, mate and then the female gives birth in the, in the world of bees. If you have a well-mated queen, meaning that she comes from giant, uh, genetic strong stock, mm -hmm. and she has mated with drones, when she goes out on her mating, mating flight, she'll mate, with, she'll mate with several drones in the air, and she'll come back and she'll start laying daughter uh, worker, worker bees uh, that are strong and diverse genetically. If they're carried over well through the winter, then the following spring, they will reach a certain volume of size anywhere from March all the way into July. And uh, if, they're, if they are uh, strong enough in numbers of bees, the workers will start to grow queen cells, which are round and hang down. And they'll grow anywhere from six to 10 of those in the hive. Mm -hmm. And uh, it takes 16 days from egg to hatch for a queen. And on the 11th day, five days before the queens hatch, they will stop feeding mom, who's been busy laying her own weight in eggs a day because it takes five days for her to skinny up so that she can fly a short distance with a bunch of bees, mm -hmm. many of them younger bees, at the phase of life for a growing comb, which comes out of their abdomen in eight little uh, sections, uh, and for feeding baby bees. So there'll be a bunch of what are called nurse bees that'll fly out, and there'll be some scout bees. These are the older bees in their last third of their life that know the terrain. They have been gathering nectar and pollen and propolis and bringing it to the hive so they know the neighborhood and they all these bees will go out so one queen a bunch of nurse bees and some scouts will fly out of the hive they'll land typically on a limb they take a big drink of honey before they leave the mother hive and then the outside bees will debate where to go they'll fly in different directions and they're looking for a cavity either in a structure uh, a cavity in a tree or an abandoned beehive that's available and they'll come back and they'll debate this and they might have 10 different potential final destinations but, and then there will be fact checkers, other scout bees that will come back and they just, by, by using the waggle dance, they'll have different debates. And when 60% of the total bees agree on a place, they'll uh -huh. all agree. So they're having a conversation. They're having a conversation, yeah. they're having a debate. And once they reach 60%, which is quorum, then they'll all agree and they will tell the inside bees that have just been waiting for the decision to be made by the girls in the know, the crones, the old girls. Uh, and then they'll take to the air one more time and those scout bees will guide using pheromones. They will guide the whole cloud that has no idea where they're going. They will guide them to that location. And uh, some of the scout bees will land at the little hole that they've found and they will stick their butt in the air and send up a homecoming pheromone which will drift into the cloud of nurse bees and the queen and they'll all go into that cavity 
and the uh, nurse bees. <clears throat> the nurse bees will immediately be building comb on top, and once that comb gets big enough, the queen will be able to lay eggs, and they'll be putting in honey, uh, nectar, rather, that they'll, they'll thicken into honey and pollen. Meanwhile, back at the mother hive, one of those queens will hatch out, and there's usually a dominant queen, and uh, she will then become the new mother of the original hive. So, so that's what it's So there's a dominant queen. Okay, so I have, a, I have a question for you. Yes. Our, our bee team, um, one of them used to be a commercial beekeeper, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he was suggesting that um, one of our hives, so we had one hive that was still alive, mm -hmm. and we added two new hives. Right. And then that next winter, the one that used to be alive was no longer alive. And his theory was that, um, uh, actually the one in the center was the one that stayed alive. The two new ones died out. Okay. Um, his theory was that the pheromones of the queen in the center one were stronger, um, or that maybe the others were too close and so the bees went into that center hive. Do they? Do no. they switch? They don't switch I, hives? I, I think that is a false assessment. Mm -hmm. I, have, um, I have taken bees out of structures that are right next to each other. So uh, in Scapoose, in an abandoned house, I took out six hives out of one house. And two of the, four of the six hives were pairs or right next to each other, only separated by a two by four. So, uh, and they had their own separate queens, and their own, their whole separate uh, community. So um, I can't, usually if a hive dies out, if there are no bees and honey left behind, that meant that the bees uh, genetically did not have the ability to feel the, the mites, the varroa mites, feasting away on the pupa oh inside the cell. Yeah. But if they do have that ability, which they inherit from both mom and dad, then they'll rip open the cap and they'll pull out the pupa and they'll bite and kill the mites. And you only need about 5 to 10% of your total bee population to have that trait called mm -hmm. varroa sensitive hygiene. But if they don't have it, then they will succumb to mites. Oh my goodness. This is why breeding for bees that uh, do have uh, the ability to self-cleanse the hive of mites is so important. Okay. And not to rely on, uh, you know, any kind of miticide or the like. Miticide. Yeah, it seems like every year we have one or two hives that die out. Mm-hmm. Is that well, pretty common? Oh, it's very common. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what could we do to prevent that? Uh, test to see if they uh, have an increasing uh, population of mites. And if they do, then uh, send word out into the community that you're looking for a queen that uh, expresses, that, that has uh, what, what you call varroa sensitive hygiene traits and get a queen like that into your hive. Okay. All right. So we, need, we may need to import new new queens yes um okay what about what do we need to provide for for bees i know when they put the new hives they put a jar with water and some sort of sugar or something i'm opposed to using any kind of non-natural uh feeding unless it's absolutely necessary so if i catch a swarm in the spring mm -hmm. and uh and the weather uh, looks like it's going to be very cold, like below 55 for a, an extended period of time, more than three or four days, then I will feed the bees. Um, but um, what, do you, what do you feed them? I don't feed them anything. Oh. But if I needed to, I would feed them, um, I would ideally feed them, uh, you know, sugar, water, honey, mm -hmm. ideally, honey and, uh, and actual pollen if I really needed to. Okay, but, I don't know what they had in theirs, but they just did it when they first put the right. new beehives right. in there. Right, yeah, they yeah. usually feed them with sugar water. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. Yep. But, right. you know, bees bees are meant to collect nectar from blossoms. Mm -hmm. So let your dandelions grow, uh, try to plant, uh, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, small leaf maple or vine leaf, vine maple, this sort of thing, something that's indigenous. Vine maple, that's a native? Yes, it is, yeah. and uh, and they they flower early, and they give a lot of nectar, um, and you know these are good starting plants, uh, early early plants. Um, that's what you want. So, so native plants are good good for bees. Well, so uh, yes, native plants are good for bees, as are uh, the so-called bitter Mediterranean herbs, you know, sage, rosemary, thyme, oregano, uh, wintergreen. These are mm -hmm. all excellent plants 
both uh, medicinally for bees because the nectar and the pollen carry more um, medicinal qualities to them, but they are also very good for humans to eat as well. So from a culinary perspective. Right. Um, we have a lot of like vegetable crops and mm -hmm. fruit trees, berry mm -hmm. bushes, that kind of thing. That's why we have the bees yep. here. Yeah. Um, but do we need, you know, do we need anything else? Like I know the group garden put the, a crop of these purple flowers, the phacelia, mm -hmm. for, and they seem to be buzzing all over that. Would sure. that just dis distract them from our crops or is it something that really helps the bees and, and will be beneficial to I, I don't know if I'm crops. qualified to answer that question. I, I really don't know. Um, I'd say if you have, if you provide habitat, nesting habitat, for native bees, uh, at, especially if you have honeybees. So if you're gonna be a honeybee keeper, it's because you want the honey and propolis. If you don't want or need the, the honey or the propolis, mm -hmm. then don't bring on honeybees because they will compete to some extent with your native pollinators, which are you know, already feeling the pressure from all these other things that we've mentioned. So, uh, in that, and if that's the case, then don't do honeybees, just provide really great habitat for native bees and plant a lot of native plants mm -hmm. um, and also plant then also for your own consumption and the and the and the pollinators will visit those plants yeah what what kind of homes do we need for native bees like mason right mason bees sure well there's, there's different kinds uh, they really love tubes right so uh, I'm I'm of the opinion that creating the nests that are in like little layers, like pancake layers with notches drilled in them so that in uh, November you can take them apart, strip out the cocoons, wash them in sand or water, uh, and then release them in little cartons the next year are good because they will be attacked by mites uh, or oh. by... Um, by parasitic wasps mm -hmm. so I think that's good it takes very little time and you get a much healthier crop then of mason bees and you can then be little Johnny mason bees with your you, know, you can send those out to your friends and neighbors and how about um, bumblebees do we need to make homes for those oh yeah yeah there, there's there's two simple ways for bumblebees one is to take a, a small birdhouse or a box that you know is has the same sort of dimensions, you know, kind of eight by eight by eight or a little bit smaller, and put something light in it, like gather up your dryer lint and, uh, and put okay. dryer lint in there. Right. Because uh, uh, it's quite amazing what the bumblebee female does is she'll be all but frozen kind of all winter long, and then when February shows up, she'll just sort of thaw out and she'll take to the wing, and she'll need uh, nectar and pollen you know really right away so and she's looking for habitat so she's in a very cold days you know 50 degree rainy day she's out there flying and collecting nectar and she's looking for a good home and so she's looking for insulation because all on her own she gathers nectar makes the wax cells to grow an initial set of daughter uh, bumblebees and then she can stay in the nest from there on out and let her daughters go out and gather more uh, nectar to make more cells so that she can become more of an egg layer inside the nest rather than going out on her own. Mm -hmm. So uh, either that or you can take a pot, one of those nice, you know, 10 inch ceramic pots and use some insulation material and um, and some uh, chicken wire and you can invert it. So there's, there's different models and some of them are at my website, um, urbanbeesandgardens.org. So okay, you have some good resources. I have some fine resources there on your website yep. yeah and then for alkaloid bees the, so, the sweat bees having a really s sandy area is good too so 50 percent sand and about 18 inches deep and uh, these uh, sweat bees will find those areas and they will begin to make their homes in that sandy soil and providing some mud like you know, like oh, interesting. there's a muddy area right probably maybe off camera but there's uh -huh. a, just a little muddy area so if you took a tray and you uh, put just mud in there and and added water to it the mason bees will come and gather up that mud, to uh, which is a part of their egg laying process. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, I know some people are afraid of, you know, bee stings. Sure. And um, when you visited my permaculture class, you had all the students stand right there next to the beehives when you were working on them, mm -hmm. and they were just swarming 
all over and yeah. nobody got nobody got stung so yeah. is that's typical yeah yeah so there's no there's no reason to be kind of fearful of bees i'd say uh people's fears about bees are based on um completely erroneous information so we're all victim of sort of the news cycle of bleeding and leading right so there's a lot of uh there's a lot of hyperbole there's a lot of uh you know, a reactive, emotive uh, gestures that are inside what's so-called news, but it is not in any way factual. Right. Okay. Um, well, I brought some things. It's kind of an art project. Yes. Um, it's uh, what we do here at Kailash is we find the bees swimming in the bird baths. Mm -hmm. So we try to make water for them that's easy for them to get to. Yep. Um, so I thought we could just make some uh, bee bowls. Mm -hmm. And if you want to bring over that bucket of rocks. Bucket of rocks. Yeah. That enough for now that's probably good and then we All can right. just grab them from from down here sure so um yeah so what we usually do is put some of the bigger rocks in first mm -hmm. and we try to use um, kind of a shallow dish i think these you know the thicker ones are a little bit better because mm -hmm. these dry out so quickly mm -hmm. um and can I describe mine as well, as long as you're doing that? Yeah, sure. So what, what uh, I recommend through Urban Bees and Gardens is to use a large casserole tray, which you can get at Goodwill for pennies. And, uh, you know, they're usually about two inches tall. And Ooh, that's get probably loud. The, the bigger diameter, the better. I'll put some soil in the bottom, and then I'll put hardwood chips. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then I'll put in moss. So it's about like a third moss. And then I'll fill that with water and the moss gives the bees a huge amount of surface area to land on and drink. And then I'll either uh, put it in my phone to remind myself to water it on a daily basis or I'll um, uh, put a little drip line on it. Just a slow drip line. Because consistency of water is what's important. If you, if you offer water that's great, but if you forget, then the bees will forget too, and they'll go to the neighbor's kiddie pool or jacuzzi. So do you think um, this would be good if we filled it with water? Would this be suitable for yeah. a bee? Yeah, okay. depending, depending on the elevation of the water. See, it's, it's quite easy for bees to drown, uh, and they do like to drink from slimy, they like slime. Right. Because slime will have all sorts of micronutrients in it, uh, minerals, that uh, will attract them. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. and then this makes a nice, like, kind of art project for the garden. So, Brian, thank you for being with us. Thank and you, Pandora. And I will put your information on the video Lovely. and on our website for people to find you. Woohoo! Cool. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks for watching Earth Village. If you like what you see on our channel, then please hop on over to YouTube and subscribe. Also, you can turn on notifications. That will let you know when our videos pop up and you'll be the first one to see them. You can also visit us on earthvillage.org.